Welcome, Soundies, to our Sound for Video session. I uh, hope everyone's doing well out there. Today's the Color Clash edition of the Sound for Video session with this shirt. Uh, but I hope you're all doing well out there. I'm glad to hear there's some cooler weather for you out there, Mark, in Texas. And I uh, hope everybody is doing all well. Tech Guy Allen is still hot and humid in Florida. So uh, uh, stay cool. Stay cool, everybody, and stay warm when you need to be warm. All right, let's uh, let's jump into things here. I am running this solo today, so um, this could be this could prove to be exciting. But let's go ahead and do our best here. Hopefully, uh, let me know if there are any technical issues, um, and let's uh, let's go for it. First of all, um, where have you been, Curtis? I have been uh, in San Francisco for most of the last three weeks. And it, the reason for that is that I work for a company called Webflow. Webflow makes a product, a software product that allows people to build their own websites. It's different from, say, for example, Wix or Squarespace in that you have way more power. You basically have the full power of HTML and CSS. Um, so you can do much more customized sites, um, you know, just a lot more power. But what comes with that additional power is a much steeper learning curve than things like Wix or Squarespace. And so that's where my role is. I'm on the education video team, and it was our team that put together this live keynote. So this is a little bit outside of our normal uh, work. Normally we produce videos, and I also work with the team that produces the written user documentation. So we do all of the all of that. Of course, I also work with, a, we also have a design team within the education team as well. So we partner and uh, Sarah, Sarah and her design team make all of the like the motion graphics and a lot of the other graphics that go into our videos. Um, I have Colin and Lex over working on user documentation, and then I work with Stacy, Mark, Greamer, Jamie, Lauren over on the video team. So we all came together um, along with our community team to put on our annual conference called Webflow Conf. And if you have not seen it, and you probably haven't, and a lot of you don't work in this space, I realize that. But um, let me just pull up the video here. So what this what what happened is that we produced the live the the content for the live show itself. We had a variety of our of our executive team get up on stage to a live audience um, that was also live streamed, and we were responsible for putting together all of the content and working with the production team the the like the technical production team that we hired to actually do all of the the technical elements of the show so we hired a company called trademark and they're based in the bay area as well uh, the conference was in san francisco and we worked with them so i interfaced with them a lot to make sure that we had all the tech stuff worked out and then of course working with the team that's producing the live demos that, that were presented on stage. And let me just see if I, I'm gonna pull this up here. And I put this in the invite um, for the stream here, but we'll also, I can drop it in the chat here in just a moment. The link is, go ahead and put that in the chat. There we go. So that is the, the show that we produced. And this is the version that was edited after. Let me just mute that for now. Um, but let me just share this with you. And so you can see what we're talking about here. So that's Vlad, our CEO, up on stage there presenting to the crowd. And the way this worked was in addition to the live show, we also recorded everything uh, all the isolated camera feeds and all the isolated microphone feeds to ISOs on a hyperdeck and into an audio recorder. And then in post-production, this is what you're seeing here is the, the final edited version. So the actual live presentation was about an hour and 13 minutes. And when we edited it down in post, it, it came in at one hour and 10 minutes. So we, we shaved off about three minutes just to tighten things up a little bit to address any issues that we ran into in terms of the actual live switching. Uh, and things like that. So that's the background for where I've been for the last few weeks here. And let me just jump ahead here. So we had some demos. And so here, for example, is Vlad sitting at the desk doing a demo, software demo, uh, showing how one of our new features works. 
And you can see microphone wise, uh, all of the presenters are using these headset microphones. We actually find those work really, really well in these situations. Nobody came to me and complained, oh gosh, I wish you hadn't used those microphones that we can see the entire time. <laughs> and the nice thing is, is that these presenters are wandering around on stage, turning their heads, doing the demos, facing the audience, looking back at the screen to do the demo. So tracking them is really, really important. We're really happy with those, those microphones. So that worked well for us. So we would do that again. And last year we actually used lavalier microphones hidden under the shirts. Got a little bit of clothing rustle. Um, this avoided that issue altogether, although visually it's a little bit different. But again, for a live presentation, people usually have expectations where that's not a problem for them. Have some more live demo here. Um, some of our other pre presenters. Here's our chief technology officer who also presented. Here's uh, one of the co-founders, Bryant, that presented. He also did some demos. Um, here's our president, chief operating officer. And then here's our uh, director of community, Emily, whom I work with as well. So we uh, we had a overall I would say it was it was a success I think if you if you you know it's a long you, you don't have to watch the whole thing unless you want to learn how to do um, de develop and, and build amazing sites websites um, but it all worked out really well and it's it's a challenge to get live demos presented on um, without crashing without running into issues and we did run into some very very minor issues but let me talk through some of the things that we did to um to work through this christopher and matt both ask which headset mic were you using and the truth is i don't even know um i was so consumed with everything else that i had to do um, i had to trust the the mixer to take care of everything uh so i don't even know i'm pretty sure they were either countrymen or dpa most likely so um, they, they sounded uh, to me quite good and in fact in post-production we did do a little bit of audio processing i did the mix and the um, the biggest thing we needed to do was mouth declick so i used a lot of rx mouth declick and in fact for um one of the presenters we we were able to eliminate 725 <laughs> mouth clicks <laughs> so again just a you know every every voice is a little bit different so that was really nice to be able to take care of that in the post the post mix here so basically in pr traditionally these are called live to tape obviously we're not using tape anymore in our case uh, live to disc so that's the kind of production i guess i would call it and they, they, it's it's a it's an interesting challenge for someone who does sound if you're if you normally work in a kind of a post-production workflow type of experience it's a different experience this is kind of the challenge of both um the good thing about this is that post-production is a little bit more straightforward because if you've got everything worked out, you're generally just tuning things a little bit more once you get to post as opposed to like really crafting things in post like you might for a TV show or a, a non-live TV show or a movie. So in any case... Um... Oh, no, okay, so that was, the, that was the sound there. That was the main thing. We did a little bit of just a little bit of... Um... A high pass filter and that was really it i kept it really really simple again the sound that we got from production was really quite good so could i have done some noise reduction sure um but we kept the we kept things pretty simple and the venue was quiet enough there's a little bit of a hum you can hear in the background but um in any case that's that's how that came out so overall pretty happy with that the challenge with lot so <laughs> let me um let me just, I'm going to pull a picture up here to, to give me just a couple of minutes. And I'll keep talking while I'm sending that out. But the, the thing that was interesting is that for those of you that have not worked on a production like this before, the secret is not having one person that is amazing at everything. The secret here is having a team of people all of which are really good working together and also that know their individual craft well. And that's just the reality of the situation. So how many people did we have on the production crew? So including Stacy as our lead producer, Mark is a lead producer, uh, Greemer was there as well, also a senior producer. I had 
Matthew and Lex. So Lex is one of our technical writers. Matthew is one of our community team members. Um, their job was the demo experience. So their job was setting up the demo desk, the computers, the environment on those computers, and making sure everything ran smoothly because that's a big risk when you're doing live demos for software in some parts of the software that are not complete yet. <laughs> um, so there were some challenges there. So I, I put... We had two of them on that. Um, and then, of course, we had the entire trademark crew. And I think the trademark crew was probably... It looked like there were two people on sound. There was a person on graphics. There was a streaming engineer. There was the technical director. There was assistant technical director. There was a, um, a switcher operator. Um, there was a producer. There was an, uh, kind of an assistant producer. There was another person in the in the control room that I don't even know what they were doing exactly, <laughs> to be honest. Um, oh, there was a recording engineer as well. So just someone that was managing all the hyperdecks and all of the recording of ISOs. So we had a, there's a lot going on. And let me just get you a photo here of the control room, just so you can get a sense for what that looked like. Um, Mark, also one of our producers, ended up... Um, also operating teleprompter. So you have a teleprompter here in productions like this. And let me just see if we can get that image up here. Okay. Oh, whoops. As I said, I literally pulled, uh, drove in, drove back and pulled in last night close to midnight. So things are not quite as refined as I usually like to have them, but here is where we're at right now. So, okay, I can switch over to this. So here's a picture of the control room. Um, this is Mark, our one of our lead producers, and he is operating the teleprompter here. Here's the graphics guy. Um, here's the... Um, not, uh, not a hundred percent. I think one of them, others is also, one of them is, I think a camera technician, like a DIT, but not off, you know, not, not necessarily offloading, but make, making sure that the color on all the cameras is right. Um, the, this is the producer back here. There's a streaming engineer that's sitting over here by all the hyperdecks. Here's the assistant. Uh, technical director. Here's the switch operator. The, the technical director is actually hiding behind this guy. <laughs> this is an assistant or an associate producer over here. Um, and then I was down here also talking with the technical director through the entire show. So it definitely takes a team to put on a production like this. So a uh, really nice, beautiful venue. We were in San Francisco um, in a place called SF Jazz. So it's typically a jazz venue and just an amazing facility that did a did a great job for us. So that is kind of the uh, the background on where I've been for the last few weeks. Um, so Christopher asked, here, here's a couple questions in the chat that we'll take here. How'd you get video from the computers? HDMI out, NDI, other. So HDMI out into a converter and then SDI from there over to the switchers. So that's how we did that. I don't, I don't believe we were using any NDI. Um, I remember when Steve Jobs' Mac crashed during a live demo, demo. it happens. So here, here's the nature of, so what we did on the computer side, we had two computers, uh, two Mac minis that were actually attached to the underside of the demo desk there. We had a KVM switch, which I think was actually the source of our problems. And I'll describe the problems in just a few minutes here. Just a single uh, Apple Studio monitor and um, a touchpad and a mouse so that they could scroll with their left hand and mouse with their right hand just works well in the in the software that we're using. And um, at, oh, we also had a hyperdeck um, just to make the process of inserting text into different fields as part of some of the demos quicker. So they could just push a button and it would type like a paragraph or something like that. And was that everything? And then they also had an iPad on the desk, an iPad mini with the kind of an outline of the steps of each of the demos. So there were two presenters that did demos, Vlad, our CEO, and Bryant, our co-founder. <clears throat> and what happened at one point, they made it through the first three demos 
flawlessly. It was beautiful. And then got to the fourth demo, I believe it was. Maybe it was the third, it was third or fourth demo. And for whatever reason, this, the the uh, Stream Deck stopped working. And I'm pretty sure it's the KVM switch to which it was attached. And then um, also on the iPad mini, it got knocked out of presentation mode. And so, you know, when you're in a live situation like that, presenting to hundreds of people in, in person, plus thousands of people live, it's really hard <laughs> to, and you don't want to take a bunch of time and troubleshoot something while you're on stage. And so it just got, it turns out with the iPad, all that happened is it got knocked out of presentation mode. And so he was discombobulated. Fortunately, both of the presenters had presented enough or kind of rehearsed enough that they didn't really need that. So that was fine. Um, but they lost the stream deck. And so they had to kind of punt and, and just type in some text instead. So that was the extent of the, the failures there. The KVM switch, we should have tested more ahead of time. And honestly, um, we, we stayed on the previous version of Mac OS. So we didn't upgrade to Sonoma, which had come out before the conference. Not going to do that because we had tested it solely with Ventura, the, the previous version. Um, so I actually, I think the biggest issue we had was that KVM switch, which we just hadn't tested enough to really uh, make sure it. So uh, Zach, it was, the venue was called SF Jazz. Again, the, there's a jazz venue there. Beautiful little facility. It, it seats like 500, maybe 600. And um, just a really nice, nice facility. All right. Matt or Mark, you were at, oh, that demo with Steve Jobs when it, when it crashed. <laughs> yes. Um, Vincent, great to have you here today. All right. Talking a little bit about the microphones earlier on, Christopher said, for what it's worth, I have the Shure, uh, four Shure TH53s and been really happy with them. Much preferred head worn over lobs when people aren't freaked out about it being visible. Completely agree for these kind of things. Definitely agree. Those ugly mouth noises, indeed. All right. So that's kind of the story. Um, uh, also had a couple of audience mics. So in post, we actually didn't end up having to use, it's a very, it's a five or 600 seat venue. It was actually pretty intimate. It was not, it's not a huge, huge venue. And so one of the challenges we had in, at the last conference we did last year was that we didn't have audience mics set up. So we actually had sent a bunch of people out with iPhones and or phones and just had them recording <laughs> during the event and then tried to cut some of that in. That turned out to be a real challenge. Um, wasn't great. So we, this year, actually asked the production company to put up some audience mics and that, that worked beautifully. And in fact, we didn't actually have to pull that into the mix too much because of the head-worn mics that the presenters were wearing, again, because it's a relatively small venue. Um, they picked up the audience just almost perfectly. Like we didn't even have to do a lot of automation to, to tune the levels of the audience. It just came out really, really nicely. We got, that was pretty lucky in that case. All right. All right, question from Fachiri. Are you upgrading to Sonoma? Of course I will. Um, I'm not yet. So typically the way I do it is I check in with the manufacturers of the audio hardware that I'm running. Those are the big things for me. So I have to make sure that my Apollo interfaces will work okay with it. A um, couple other things. I could just want to make sure, for example, the switcher works okay. Um, I actually have a list. I made a list in my notes app so that I would <clears throat> never have to kind of reinvent the wheel. And let me just pull that up here. There are a couple of things that I check in on. Give me just a moment to find that here. Do, do, do. What, I'm, what I do here is I just make notes for myself so it's a lot easier to update. I'm not finding it. I don't want to waste your time here looking for it, but I do make a list for myself of all the hardware that I want to make sure that is compatible with a new version before I upgrade. So I'll typically update my laptop first because I'm not usually connecting all that hardware to that. Um, so I'll update the laptop first, test it out for a while. And honestly, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll update 
on the 0.0 whatever release on the laptop. And then when we get to the 0.1, usually the other manufacturers have got their drivers and everything updated. And that's when I'll move my main Mac Studio over to that version or whatever my main computer is at the time. So that's usually my upgrade strategy when it comes to Mac OS. All right. Here's a question from Jules. Um, do you know if there's a USB-C attachment which can be used with the iPhones to monitor the audio as a video is being recorded using the Rode mics? That's partly app dependent, Jules, to be honest, but I think there is um, Rode. Oh, yeah, I don't. You might be able to use their their own thing. I don't. I don't have an answer in, because I don't have experience. I don't have a sure answer because I have never tried to do this. I don't usually do a lot of recordings with iPhones, um, or on my phones and mobile devices. But if I were the first place I would look is that Rode has. I believe they call it their AI Mini. And let's just go over to Rhodes website. Let's pull that up here so you can see. Here, that's the Mo, oh, sorry. Whatever this little guy is called. So, oh, that's lightning. I guess they're going to have to do a new version. I thought they had a version. Oh, here it is, AI Micro. This is the one I was thinking of. So this is basically a compact audio interface. Whoa. Did they discontinue that? Did I do that wrong? AI Micro. We have a dead link there. So, Rode, if any of you are watching, you might want to let your web team know <laughs> there's a broken link. Maybe it's under here. Here it is. We have the AI Micro. Let's see if this gets us to the right page. There it is. So this is a USB-C, um, basically mini audio interface. You could feed... I don't know if this is really going to solve your problem because I think each of these are mono inputs. So I was going to say you could connect the output of the receiver into here. And then you have the headset. Um, yeah, you're actually... Jules, you're... if Oh, I don't know if you're on the... If you're using the Wireless Pro, that has a headphone jack on the receiver itself. So that's one thing. Again, I don't know which you're using. But anyway, I would look into the AI Micro and see if that solves your, your issue. All right. Matt mentions the Steve Jobs Theater at Apple is one of the most amazing venues, but few get to use it. I would like to visit there before I die <laughs> and, and see a see an event there. Okay. Matt says, always wait for the dot one release. I think certainly for production hardware, yeah, I always wait for the, the point one release as well. Definitely for the production world. And it's nice, yes, the iPhone 15 family now natively USB-C. I have mixed feelings about that, by the way. I, I'm happy about that on the one hand um, because of things like this. Now, that just sort of standardizes things. You can get more power in. It's faster interface. The one thing I don't like about it, or there's about, is I think we have to be honest, and there's a downside to it, and that is I have never found USB-C connectors and ports to be as robust as lightning. I've never had a problem with a lightning port or a lightning connector. I have had several USB-C ports fail on me over time mechanically. That is to say, just after all of the friction of, of inserting and removing cables, um, over time they just get loose and then they, they don't hold a connection well. So I have had that problem um, before, and that's the one thing that I hope that Apple has engineered that port so that you are less likely to, to experience that but never had that problem with um, lightning. But anyway, some good things about it. All right, Homesick Mac, thanks for joining us. Uh, great Webflow event presentation, thanks so much. 
Uh, Christopher also mentioned, yeah, assuming the iPhone will let you monitor to a USB audio class device, most anything would work. Um, I would say in that case, so your the app that is running on the phone has to support output at the same time. Some do and some don't. Um, so just make sure you check that. Um, Alan asked a good question. How could you have tested the KVMs better and how could you have better KVMs if a problem was found? Uh, honestly, Alan, what we probably would have done before the show is we would have, if we had known there was a risk with that KVM right before the show and we didn't have a chance to, to change anything else, we would have eliminated the KVM from the signal chain. And then if things had gone south, we would have, we had backup videos as well. So we, instead of the presenters doing live demonstrations, we would have had the production company roll um, pre-recorded screen capture videos of the new features themselves. And then the presenters would just voice over live to those. So that was our backup plan. The, the KVM switch was if something happened, like if one of the computers crashed, we could switch to the secondary and all this, you know, all the keyboard, the mouse, the everything would be set to go. Um, but it was, I think it was pretty much that KVM. What could we have done with just more rehearsals, uh, just more rehearsals, period. And then if we found it was a problem, we would have opted to do what I just said, which was skip the KVM altogether and then have one of our techs run up on stage while the presenter was moving on or, or kind of voicing over the pre-recorded video so that the next demo would be ready to go. So that's those are probably the kind of the most practical things we could have done. As it was, um, we put in a lot of time in testing, so it was just unfortunate that that, and this is a, it's a hypothesis. We don't even know for sure if it was the KVM, but I'm pretty sure it was the KVM. And it's sort of something about the interaction between the Stream Deck and the KVM switch, it just didn't, they didn't get along. <clears throat> I think the Stream Deck probably figured, oh, we're not connected anymore, we're just gonna shut down. Um, so something like that is my best guess. Mark mentioned, uh, with, or has a question, I ran solo camera op for a conference recording 19 presentations, captured video of presenter and took audio feed from the mixer, aux to my mix pre, all went well. In post, I need to lay in presenter's slides and wish I'd capture them as a video track. Any ideas for capture of a slide presentation? Yes, we used Hyperdex. Um, so any sort of deck that can record those um, that's exactly what we did. So that in the post version, when the when the live switching was happening, sometimes they missed some. I mean, the it's really hard to hit cues when it's live presented because the live presenter may change their pacing a little bit. Uh, they're reacting to the audience when they're up on stage, and so you can't get it exactly right. So there were a few beats that they missed, and then we fixed those in post by having that recording of the slides. So that's that's what I would do is record them to a hyperdeck if you can. Uh, Vincent says, interesting, that could be an issue since most ports USB-C is OEM from some clearinghouse and wouldn't expect the USB-C would be any more robust, would not be any more robust than current. Yeah, I've just, that's just my personal experience. I have had USB-C ports fail. I've never had a lightning port fail. Just other people may have had a different experience. I just find that USB-C cables in particular and ports loosen up over time after a lot of use. Oh, that's fine, Mark. I, we, we do video. I, my, my title is Director of Video Production, so <laughs> we're okay to talk about other things as well. If it's not the KVM, it's DNS. It's always DNS. <laughs> It's always something. Um, Matt says, USB-C connector I've been using on my iPad Pro has been rock solid as I use it more than Lightning because I use my iPad Pro way more than my phone. Old eyes, much bigger screen. Yeah. I, mine has been fine too. I've had this iPad Pro since 2021? Early 2021? I, I think. I can't remember when we got it exactly, but um, it's been okay so far. Yeah, it's been okay so far, but we don't we don't plug it in nearly as much as I do plug in my phone. The where I had the USB C ports fail before was on a MacBook, actually. 2016 MacBook, late 2016 MacBook. I still and Danny still uses that computer just for like 
she's going to do an exercise class or whatever and just wants to put it up in a you know stream something back um we those USB-C ports are a nightmare at this point. And that's old. Granted, I get it. That's a really old laptop. But that's my experience is that <clears throat> um, it's just not as robust. And I think that that's the reason. Honestly, it was before USB-C was... I think it was before USB-C was finalized that Apple came out with the Lightning connector. And I think part of the challenge is that USB-C is governed by a, an entire board. There are a bunch of participants from a whole bunch of different companies that come to together to make it. And Apple saw what was going on and how long it was taking. They wanted to get away from their ridiculous old, um, what was it? A, I don't remember how many pin port they were using on the original iPods and the earlier iPhones. And they just wanted to get away from those. And so they created their own, which is how we got lightning. And I, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> I don't like that there's that fracture. And obviously the European Union doesn't like it so much. In fact, that they passed legislation um, but, and yeah, I think Apple has some consternation about it as well, because it's going to cost them a lot of money and did cost them a lot of money. Um, but this is, this looks like this is Alan's experience as well, where that, uh, the lightning versus USB-C. I just say, I say, just give me a VNC connection and we stay friends. Well, I, I hear what you're saying, Vincent, although I don't think anyone's going to want a BNC connector on sticking out of the bottom of their phone. So, <laughs> um, Christopher's point is it may just be the, the quality of the connectors. Um, that's on the cable side, on the port side too. That's where I've, that's where uh, cables are easy. You can replace those. I'm not as concerned about those. And yeah, if, if those, um, fail over time, although I've never had to replace a lightning cable either because of the connector um you can replace those i'm more concerned about the ports especially in laptops where they're not easily replaceable that's where i had the and in a phone like but again a lot of these electronics are designed to be obsolete which gives me no end of heartburn anyway all right uh we have a question here should i keep my zoom fx I think you mean Zoom F6 connected to my Deity timecode one timecode for the whole recording session, or is it enough to just synchronize Zoom's timecode at the beginning? Hey, from Ukraine. Great question. The Zoom F6 has an inbuilt or uh, yeah, a timecode generator built in. So you just need to jam sync it at the start. It's your cameras that you typically need to leave those timecode generators connected to. So the TC1 you want to keep connected to your camera. Um, through the shoot. Good question, but you don't need to keep it connected to the F6. As soon as you've got those two jammed synced together, then you're fine to disconnect them. Uh, Eric says, there's got to be some engineering measures on the total number of insertions before a physical connector like Lightning, Lightning or USB-C AB are reliable. Yeah, I would see, I'm sure there's an MTBF, mean time before failure. Um, I don't know how many of the manufacturers actually do that testing, but Anyway, uh, Zach asks if I've ever had an HDMI port fail on a laptop. A friend's monitor stopped being recognized from an HP laptop, and it may be the port. I haven't. Um, yeah, no, I haven't had that yet. Although I think the same issue, it could be the same issue there. Okay. Let's uh, let's go ahead and jump over. We have some questions that were submitted ahead of time, and let's go take a look at those really quickly. So I'm going to switch on over here. All right, this is a question from Dwayne. What's your workflow for making a mono track into a stereo track? Do you just copy paste the identical file onto a new additional track, or do you make minor tweaks like pan to the left or right to it before exporting? I'm coming from an area of nature sounds and not so much spoken word, if that makes a difference. Um, that's a great question, Dwayne. So you're not going to... Usually nature recordings are recorded in stereo format. So that's the first thing. If you're trying to get a stereophonic image, you would generally want to record it in stereo. But if not, if you just have a mono recording, um, then no, I just make it dual mono, which literally just same thing on the left and right channels. Exactly the same thing. That's generally like if you're using a, long, a shotgun microphone and you're trying to isolate 
say there's a bird up in a tree and you're trying to get just the bird recording um, and not as much of the other ambient sound and that's that's where you would do that and so it's usually that's when you're going to do a mono recording if you're intentionally trying to get immersive ambient sound then you're typically want to go to going to want to record that in stereo from the start um, so in that case then you would <clears throat> you would be able to do some panning or whatever tweaks you wanted to do there with the stereo recording but if you're starting with a mono recording um, you can put it on a like if you want to do a surround mix you could put it on an atmos track or you could put it on a 5-1 you know into a 5-1 mix and actually pan it around so it sounds like it's moving but that's all done in post but typically if you're just doing a stereo mix um, I would just put it a, make a dual mono track so same thing on the on both channels and then if you want to pan it if for example the camera moves and now the bird is over on this side of the frame you can pan the audio to that side of the frame to kind of keep that coherence um, between visuals and audio but typically I just I would just uh, make it a dual mono which means copying the exact same thing on the other track or the other channel of that same track so hopefully that gives you some context there next uh set of questions and they're really oh whoops I switched back so next set of questions here's from Albie really small I apologize for that but these are a series of questions Albie had on the Zoom F6. So let's just run through each of these one by one. First one is, what does it mean when the record button is blinking? So let's go to our overhead camera here. Here we have our Zoom F6. Now, Albie, when you start a recording, you, of course, you press the record button. If you want to place a marker on the track, and I've got a big battery, so I apologize. This is not like the optimal position here. Um, but you can you can actually set a marker if you set it up this way. So if I press the play button there, it sets a marker and it pauses the recording. So the blinking red record button means that it's paused. To continue recording, you press this again. So if it's blinking, that means it's paused and you're not actually capturing audio at that moment. So be careful about that. You generally don't want that. Now, if you want to stop the recording, of course, you press the stop button. So that's what the blinking uh, record button means. All right, back over to the questions here. Does AutoMix work when recording a in dual mode? And by dual mode, he means 32-bit and 24-bit recordings at the same time. The answer to that is, I don't know. Let's try and see what happens. So um, I'm going to have to do this. Kind of a weird angle. Sorry about that. That's a little hopefully better. All right, so we're going to go into the menu, and we're going to go to the record menu. And here we can choose our mode. So let's do dual mode. Let's do 24-bit and 32-bit at the same time. Okay, that's good. Now we hop back out of there. And then in the record, where is... I need to re refresh myself on where the auto mix is set up, but I think it's on the input. Yes, auto mix. And yes, it looks like you can use auto mix and the dual record at the same time, at least when you're in 48 kilohertz recording mode. If you're recording at higher sample rates than that, that's when you start to run into limitations. Here, for example, uh, you'll see that 192 kilohertz is not an option here. So if you're recording, and Albie does voiceover, so I don't think you need, I don't think you, you need 192 kilohertz. 48 kilohertz should be just fine for what you're doing there. So short answer to that question is yes. Now, I don't ever do that, so I'm going to go ahead and bump it back here into float 32-bit mode. Let's look at his next question. All right, next question. When sending line out to a camera, does the hiss still happen if I use a 3.5 millimeter to XLR connector if the camera has an XLR input? <clears throat> well, that depends on a lot of factors, Albie. Depends on the microphone input or line level input on the camera. Depends on the cable that you use. So number one, do not cheap out on cam on cables. I've seen so many people buy quality audio recorders, quality microphones, cheap out on cables, and then regret it. So and then and they see the prices of you know if you look at a Mogami cable or a Canary cable, and they see the prices on those and goes, oh my goodness, it's you know. $75 for a 25-foot cable or $100 for a 25-foot cable. That's ridiculous. And does it really make a difference? Uh, I would go with Mogami or Canary with, with Neutrik XLR connectors. 
uh, in as much as possible. So don't cheap out on the cables. That'll make a big difference as to whether or not you get hiss or not. But generally, no, if you use a quality cable, if you, um, especially if you have, if your camera has a good input that can be switched to line level, switch it to line level, and then just go line out from the F6 directly into the camera, and you should be fine. Now, some of the early versions of the F6 that were purchased when they first came out in 2019, as I recall, some of those had a little bit of a problem with their output, where when you attenuated the output, when you pulled the fader down on the output, they would get very noisy. Turns out that was a hardware issue, and they fixed it, and all of the newer versions that you could buy from, I think it was late, late 2020 to present, they fixed that in the hardware and it was no longer an issue. So if you're going into a camera where you cannot set the input to line level, and usually if you have an XLR input, you can set it to line level, but if you can't, um, then you will have to reduce or uh, pull the fader back on the output of the F6. <clears throat> and if you have one of those newer units, it shouldn't be a problem in terms of hiss. And then the final question is, what do those numbers on the battery indicator mean? Is it how many hours are left? No, it is not. And it's hard to see here, but mine currently says 7.6. What that is, is that's actually voltage. Um, so that's telling you what your current voltage is right now on your batteries. And that's useful usually from an engineering standpoint, um, depending on the batteries that you're using. If you're using alkaline versus nickel metal hydride versus lithium, they all have a point at which they don't provide enough um, and so they, the, the F6 needs, you need to actually tell the F6 which type of those batteries you're using so that it can accurately identify that. And the voltage, when the voltage gets below a certain point, and I don't remember exactly what it is on the F6, um, you can do a test on that. But when that number gets low enough, then that's when it shuts off. So you can just keep an eye on that. It helps you, it's just another way to understand how much, um, how fresh your batteries are, how much charge your batteries have remaining in them. So when you get down to the low voltage cutoff, that's when it stops working. So just another indicator there. Okay, those were the questions that were submitted ahead of time. Let's head back on out to the chat and see what else we've got. Okay, AI or I, I chair, I'm not sure how you say that, apologies, but thank you. Love your videos, so professional. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming by today. Um, Christopher notes, HDMI parts, ports are easy to fry with a static electricity shock. I don't doubt it. I think that's true of, um, uh, a lot of connectors. I don't know if, it may, and maybe, um, uh, HDMI is even more so. Did you test the Wireless Pro time code accuracy? For example, jam various traditional time code boxes from it and then check them all after, say, 10 hours. I haven't yet, Christopher. Um, uh, did we? Wait a minute. Mm, no, I don't. No, we didn't. We didn't have time to do it, so we have not done that yet. Evidently, they do have... Um, I'm surprised you're asking about that. Are you planning to use the Rode Wireless Pro? <laughs> or are you just trying to get to the bottom of uh, whether or not they're actually using a temperature comp compensated crystal oscillator in there? I've noticed that the price of those um, wholesales is quite low. So um, anyway, Alan says just to, uh, to Albie's question about cables and hum or hiss, Cable quality doesn't make much difference with hiss, but can make a difference with hum. Interesting. Thank you for that clarification. And I think that's actually right. A lot of times hiss is noise in the preamplifiers or um, yeah, usually that's at, excuse me, at the source or at the receiving end, um, but that definitely hum. I've picked up plenty of hum on different things. All right. Uh, Mark says, Sound Devices has sent customers an invitation to a MixPre live stream event that it says will include some exciting MixPre news. No details, October 16th, 2023 at 11 central time. Thanks for that, Mark. I did see that come through. Um, it'll be interesting to see. 
I'm assuming those will be software changes, but maybe not. Um, wondering, oh, okay, Christopher, about the time code is wondering if they have a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. It's too cheap a combo. Um, no, I actually think it is, a, it, according to Ryan over at Rode, it is in fact a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. I don't know, and with a 0.5 ppm, so it's it should be good. Um, I just haven't tested it yet. Um, and like I said, I think the, the wholesale prices on those TCXOs has come down a lot. So um, anyway, I think that's uh, that's what I'm that's what I'm finding here. All right, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in the chat. Just make sure you put at Curtis Jet Audio. That'll make it really easy to find it here in the chat. Um, and let's let's continue the conversation. What else can I tell you about the show? Uh, San Francisco is a is a is a fascinating city. <laughs> Amazing food choices there. So ate a lot of good food. Um, also had some interesting encounters with people on the street. Uh, one guy came walking down the street, took his shirt off and was sort of twirling it around and looking straight at me and then came up to me and started dancing and then walked off. And then, then I, I was waiting on the street, uh, for one of my colleagues to open the door. And then he turned around and came back at me. I was kind of freaked out. Um, but then he, he walked off. So, uh, no no, no bad encounters, just, um, was a little bit like, oh my goodness, what's happening here? <laughs> and, uh, and it's an expensive city too. I will say that for sure. In terms of all the places that I've been, one of the more expensive ones. All right. I'll just tell you about our signal chain for today. Um, the Earthworks ethos, I actually had someone ask me this week, what if, Money was no object, and you had to choose a microphone for yourself, a buy once and never worry about it again microphone, what would it be for this kind of situation? It's the Earthworks ethos for me. Um, I think it's a pretty good fit for my voice. I like it a lot. So that would be my choice. This is somewhat subjective, so don't take that as a any sort of authoritative, this is the microphone you should get necessarily, but from my point of view, it's a really good option. Um, that's being that's being routed over here into the Mackie DLZ creator, which is our mixing board for today. And then that's routed into the camera. And I've done this a million times. So um, apologize if you're hearing this for the millionth time that combines the audio and video in the camera. And then it sends it over to the A10 mini, A10 mini HDMI out into a cross converter or decimator cross converter that goes SDI out into the other room. And then into our Epifan Pearl Nano Encoder, which is sending it to YouTube from there. So a couple other um, things that have come in here. Nice feature of Sennheiser EWDP. No one talks about when you turn on F6, <clears throat> the receiver turns on automatically. And when you turn off the F6, the receiver goes off as well. Okay, so I see it's auto detecting the connection, the, either the camera or the recorder that you're connected to. That is a nice feature. Do you like that? Mark asks, um, where would you set up a HyperDeck for slide capture? Previous question, can they be start and stopped remotely? Um, well, in our case, we, again, I was not on the technical crew for this particular situation, but usually the way they do it is they run the feed directly into the switcher, and then they have an ISO output on the switcher. They're using one of the big rack mount switchers. And then a, an output for that individual channel um, over to a hyperdeck that recorded just the just the slides in this in this particular case. We used Apple Keynote as the presentation platform. Um, so that's that's the rough idea. Um, I don't know when you say where uh, would you set up hyperdeck for slide capture. In our case, it was in the control room. Um, can they be start and stopped remotely? I don't know. I don't know if the newer HyperDex, my current one does not have any re remote control capabilities, or does it? Actually, it might through the software control app, the ATEM software control mat, uh, app. I'm not sure about that, actually, Mark. 
you'd have to check into that. I would not be surprised if the newer versions do. Mine's actually quite old. Mine's from, I think mine was first introduced in probably 2015, 14, 15. It's an old one. So I don't have one of the newer ones. Christopher asks, have you upgraded the Mackie to the new firmware with NDI audio and tested it? I have updated it, but I have not tested it. I've been working on a keynote and uh, working long hours to get that done. So have not tested it yet. And then also, have you tested sending SRT to YouTube with the Perl or still just using RTMP? I'm using RTMP uh, right now. Um, but I have done an SRT show before where I was sending SRT to another Perl uh, across the world, in fact. We had, well, I was sending from here in Utah to uh, Photo Joseph, who was in Oregon at the time. Aaron Parecki was on the stream. Also, they were in the same city, I think, or, or nearby each other, um, both in Oregon. Uh, he, Aaron also sent an SR street, SRT stream to Photo Joseph. And then we also had John, what is John's last name? I don't remember John's last name, but he was in, uh, I think, Sweden on an LTE connection, <laughs> sending an SRT stream from Sweden to Oregon. Um, and the stream was actually pretty good. It was pretty, the quality was definitely high quality. Um, we had a couple of minor, just very quick cutouts, um, but overall it was very good. And in terms of staying in sync, um, we were all within milliseconds of each other. It was very impressive. So SRT is a really good one. Um, oh, good. Christopher says HyperDeck has an API companion and others use that API. So you could use the companion app to remotely control the HyperDeck. Yes, and it's John Barker. That's right, Eric. John Barker is the one that joined our stream there. So we have done that. Uh, Mark, ha uh, Mark is high on caffeine today and has many questions. SRT is secure, reliable transport. It's a trans. It's a it's a streaming protocol. Um, it works really, really well. Um, it keeps the video and audio in sync with each other. And it allows you to send video across the internet, basically, is what it does. So the higher-end encoders will use it. Things like Perl, Epifan Perl encoders use it, um, amongst others. So there are lots of devices that will send SRT streams. Like, for example, you can have remote um, pan, tilt, zoom cameras that's, that have just a network connection. So the only cable you have to run to those, pan, those PTZ cameras is a powered Ethernet cable. It powers the camera, plus it um, allows the communication protocol so the remote person can control the camera, pan it, tilt it, zoom it, and it also sends the SRT stream out to wherever you have it configured to go. So you can actually just send that on a local area network to whatever you're using, maybe, for example, OBS as your encoding app, or you can send it across the internet as well. So that's just one of the technologies available out there to do that. All right, Zach says, lived in San Francisco from 92 to 2008. It was great. Sadly, it's changed quite a bit, not for the better, especially post-pandemic. Um, yeah, there's a, there's unfortunately a lot of homelessness and a lot of cities really quite dirty, I would say, in a lot of parts. Um, but there are some nice parts as well and definitely great restaurants that I really enjoyed. Uh, Christopher says, SRT is more reliable than RTMP, which is an ancient protocol, generally has lowered latency as well, so might cut down the latency on YouTube live streams, which is what prompted my question. Um, yeah. There's a trade-off uh, with latency as well. The nice thing, I think, I, I don't, I can't speak to why YouTube still, R RTMP is still their main kind of way in. Um, but I think they intentionally have a normal latency setting, which is actually quite long. It's like 10 seconds or something. I mean, I guess, okay, I think it flexes depending on things, but I think in part they do that because people are trying to stream from mobile devices, from Wi-Fi at their home or with their laptop. Um, and having additional latency provides a little bit of a buffer so that if the signal does drop for a, just a, just a momentary drop, having additional latency allows it to recover before it, it gets streamed out. So there are some benefits for building in just a little bit of latency. Um, 
But in any case, SRT, um, in my experience, has worked really, really well. So I was not aware that YouTube now supports SRT. Is that what you're saying, Christopher? It does now officially support SRT streams in addition to RTMP? I'd love to try that. And it would be great to see, for example, the ATEM Mini models support that as well. I wonder if that would get past the um, some of the issues that I've had with the encoder, the, like the, the external encoder built into the A10 MIDI models. So uh, specifically, SRT is also required to stream at higher than 1080p to YouTube, though most live streams don't actually need 4K. Absolutely. I tried doing... No, actually, that's not... It wasn't... It didn't used to be true. Um, it may be true now, but when I first got the 4K switcher that I have that I don't typically use, um, we were doing R RTMP. So maybe they've changed that since then, but... I would actually recommend using SRT if you're going to be doing 4K. And I also agree, there's just not a lot of need. Um, there's not a lot of need for 4K streaming in most cases. There are a few use cases, I'm sure. I'm sure there's some gamers that would like to do it. Um, but in any case, that's the state of situation. Um, Christopher says they do have it, though might still be considered beta. Okay, cool. Eric says, I think SRT is offered to certain accounts on YouTube, not offered as an option to all channel owners. I see. Okay, so Christopher clarifies, or rather SRT is required for H.265 streaming, which you really want for 4K because it has a much better compression um, to quality ratios than, than H.264. Okay. All right, friends. It's time for me to go and clean up all the things that I have ignored for the last three weeks. <laughs> um, we'll be getting our back on track for our regular videos over on the main channel. We'll be back now with no foreseeable um, skipped weeks on the live stream. So thanks for joining us today. Get out there, make some great sound, and we'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.